In early 2019, the newsletter of the Mechanics Institute Chess Room featured some Maiden 3 chess puzzles. In this puzzle, White is clearly winning soon, but to win in just three moves is hard, I think, so I wrote a program. Chess is tough because the game tree is large, but if there's a forced win within a few moves, we can find it with a computer by exploring the game tree breadth first to find the quickest winning line. Our opponent will not cooperate, so we're looking not just for a move that leads to a win, but for a move that leads to a win for every possible response our opponent might make. On the other hand, if we do find a move that wins, despite our opponent's best play, we can stop looking for other winning moves. Information about the outcome of a game is at the bottom of the game tree, but the moves we have to choose from are at the top. As we explore the tree and discover terminal positions, these findings reveal the outcomes of positions higher in the tree. In my program, we keep in memory a copy of the game tree, the part of it we have explored. Each node of the tree represents a position, and we reserve some room for the outcome of the game that proceeds from this position, assuming best play from both sides. Whenever we find a decided position, we go up the tree and update the parent if now its outcome is known and we keep going up as long as outcomes are newly discovered. When the outcome of the root node is discovered, we can stop the search and display the best move. You're watching the program in action, solving three puzzles from the Mechanics Institute newsletter. My program actually tells you not only which is the best first move, but also what to do for each of your opponent's best responses all the way to the end of the game. Now let's look at the code. I wrote this program in Forth. Why Forth? Forth is designed to run on very modest hardware. No Windows, no Linux, no C compiler. Forth is used in robotics with microcontrollers. But clearly you can also do application programming in Forth. See my spreadsheet and volume estimation programs. The simplicity of the Forth language is useful to the programmer at all levels. I should point out I am using GForth on a Linux system and GForth does use a C compiler and the C library. My program calls the fourth standard word allocate, which in GForth calls the C library function malloc. But I don't really need malloc in this program. I could do without it. You can find the source code of my program at my website, dacvs.neocities.org. I use the text editor Vim that comes with many Linux systems. Vim has automatic syntax highlighting to make programs more readable. Comments are grayed out and the local variables appear in bright green. If your version of Vim doesn't color fourth source files automatically, search the internet for Vim fourth syntax highlighting. Here's the GForth source file of a puzzle. The word put indicates a piece placed on the board. White pieces are denoted by uppercase letters and black pieces by lowercase letters. These letters K, Q, R, B, N, P for king, queen, rook, bishop, knight, and pawn are standard in chess. This word put copies such a letter into a 64 cell representation of the initial position called board zero, and it notes any asterisks used to indicate whether castling or capturing en passant are allowed in the initial position. The word white to move or black to move indicates whose turn it is and starts the solver. And here's file chessp.fs. We'll start at the end of the file, as that's where we see the algorithm. We explore down the game tree from the root node, breadth first. When we find a terminal position, we note the outcome, pause the breadth first search, go up the tree updating the parent's outcomes, as long as they are newly decided, and resume the breadth first search. When upward updating reaches the root of the tree, we stop the search and reconstruct the best line of play by going back down the tree. You can see that words white to move and black to move start the solver. The solver sets up the root of the tree and pushes the root node onto a queue. Then we go into a loop where we take a node from the queue, and if it needs to be explored, we add all the children of this position to the tree and push them onto the queue. If the current position is now decided, we update its outcome and notify its parent. A node should be expanded if its parent's outcome is unknown. 
When we tell a node about its child's outcome, we decrement its count of its children with unknown outcomes, and we update its best known outcome. If now its own outcome is known, we notify its parent. When the root node is notified, we announce the best move and the analysis. To do this, we print out part of the game tree. The definition of show move is long for two reasons. First, in this program, we don't store moves in the tree, but positions. So we need to compare positions to compute the move. Second, the customary notation that humans like to see to denote a move is a bit irregular. Castling has a special notation. Instead of indicating the square from which the piece is moved, we show the piece name, unless the piece is a pawn, in which case we show the file name, and unless multiple pieces can move to the same square. In this case, a rank or file name is inserted to clarify which piece. I implement a simpler version of the disambiguation rules by printing the square from which the piece is moved whenever more than one piece of that color is on the board. A position is decided if it has been expanded and a winning move from this position is known, or all its children's outcomes are known. Chess is a bit odd in that the goal is to capture your opponent's king, but capturing the king never actually happens. It's illegal to let your king be captured on the next play. This rule might be useful to a player who fails to notice his king is attacked, but to the programmer it's a complication. It might be a good idea to let the king be captured in the game tree, but I chose to uphold the custom to prohibit leaving a king in check. This involves more computation to expand a node. I check that the king is unattacked by doing a simulated half move, where we see which squares the opponent attacks or hits. We see an argument H for hit mode in some of the words defined above. To see if a move is okay with respect to king safety, we make the move, call king okay, and undo the move so we can try various other moves from the same position P. You may have noticed that my variable names are pretty short, and I do this for the same reason they're short in mathematics. We want the written representation of computation to be dense so we can see a lot at once and understand what's going on. I use the variable names consistently. P is the address of a position, so is Q, the letter after P, and the lowercase p and Q are mirror images. Sometimes we refer to a position and its child at once, so we use P for the parent and Q for the child. Each position has a list of pieces. Pieces are numbered from zero, and we use N to denote the number of a piece. This number alone is not very useful, it just indicates something about the order of pieces in the initial position. When we need to refer to a second piece, usually the occupant of the target square, we use the next letter, O. The identity of a piece is its ASCII value, which we denote by M. The value tells you which man, which kind of chessman, the piece is. Uppercase letters K, Q, R, B, N, and P are white pieces, and lowercase letters are black pieces. Squares of the chessboard are grouped in files A to H and ranks 1 to 8 in what they call algebraic notation. The squares are labeled as if we were playing the white pieces with the chessboard in the first quadrant of the Cartesian plane. So X is the file and Y is the rank. In programming, it is usually more convenient to count from zero, so my variables X and Y range from zero to seven. It is more convenient still to combine these two quantities into a single number T, ranging from zero to 63. T is often used to denote time or some other one-dimensional quantity. We see f for flag, an integer whose bits indicate values true or false, and v for a variable valued 0 or 1, especially c for color, valued 0 or 1 for white or black. Imagine the game tree whose root node is the starting position of a chess game with all 32 pieces on their proper squares. The root node is at depth 0 in the game tree, and it is white to move. The last bit of the depth of a node tells you whose turn it is to move, 0 for white, 1 for black. In my program, we record the ply number of each position. A ply is a half move. The initial position given by the user is assigned ply number 0 if white is to move, 
number one if black is to move. In the definition of word successors, C is the color to move, and we move all the pieces of that color, including castling. Castling is a bit tricky. The king cannot castle out of check or through check or into check. I broke this down into several steps. See if the king is okay, move him one square. See if the king is okay, move him another square. See if the king is okay, then move the rook into place. After a castling move, both castling flags for that color are turned off. The pieces move in the directions of rooks, bishops, or knights, except for pawns, which are complicated. A pawn captures forward one square, not in its own file, but in an adjacent file. We try both sides if they're on the board and occupied by an opposing piece. A pawn can move one square forward if the square is empty, or two squares forward if both squares are empty, and the pawn has not left its starting square. Finally, a pawn may capture en passant. A non-pawn piece moves a certain distance in a certain direction. Kings and knights can go only one hop in their given directions. Queens, rooks, and bishops can move up to seven hops. But they all must stop when they run into another piece. If the other piece is opposing, they may capture it, and they must stop before they leave the board. A rank or file in the range 0 to 7, bitwise ended with minus 8, is 0, but a number outside that range, bitwise ended with minus 8, is non-zero. When a pawn moves two squares forward, we set the unpassant flag and the unpassant file. When a pawn lands on the last rank, it is promoted to queen, rook, bishop, or knight. When a rook moves from its starting square, we turn off the castling flag for that color on that side of the board, king side or queen side. If a king moves from its starting square, we turn off both castling flags for that color. In any case, we execute the move by copying the position and moving the piece to its target square. If a piece occupies the target square, the occupying piece is moved to a special location off the board named captured. The ASCII code has the property that the upper and lowercase variants of each letter differ in just one bit, the 32's place. When the 32's place is zero, the letter is uppercase, representing a white piece. When the 32's place is one, the letter is lowercase, representing a black piece. We need 64 bits or 8 bytes to express which squares are attacked. My computer has 64-bit integers, and my GeForce system has 8-byte cells, but in this program I use individual bytes here so my program can run on smaller celled machines. The child of a node is identical to its parent, except that the child begins in an unexpanded state rather than inheriting the best known outcome of its parent and being unexpanded, the child has no children. But the parent has a new child. The child's parent is noted. We reset to zero the number of the child's children with unknown outcomes. The child's en passant flag is turned off by default, and the child is enqueued. To set up the root node, we read the initial position, first counting pieces. Each position occupies two cells, plus four bytes, plus two bytes per piece. We allocate space for the root node, put it in unexpanded state, set the ply number according to the color to move, set the number of children with unknown outcomes to zero, this number increases when the node is expanded, and turn off the en passant flag. We look at the initial position in board zero and add to the record each piece and its square, taking note of the places of the kings in the record to expedite assessment of king safety. The root node has no parent, and it begins with no children. We set the castling flags. Each node of my game tree has a record comprising several fields. In fourth, we often address fields of a record simply by defining a word that adds an offset to a given address. I keep unexpanded nodes in a queue. My queue is a linked list plus a pointer to the end of the list to help us add entries quickly. I keep a dummy entry at the front to simplify the definitions of push and pop. For linked lists, I implement this word cons, a fourth analog of the lisp function cons. 
Just as in Lisp, we can use cons to construct linked lists or binary trees. Two new cells are allocated, as in Lisp's dotted pair. Lisp has functions car and cutter to return the first and second members of a dotted pair. I have neither, but I do have both, and a variant called dot pop to free the two cells. In my game tree, each node knows its children. These are kept in linked lists too. The queue and the children lists are the only places in the program I found a use for cons. I did not implement any Lisp-style automatic garbage collection. It wouldn't help this program as it's written. So there you have it, a chess puzzle solver in fourth. The source code is compact at 254 lines total, and these are fourth lines at most 64 bytes long, comprising 13 lines of fundamental data structures, 23 lines of record layout for nodes of the game tree, 18 lines of input processing, 49 lines of output processing, 29 lines of pawn moves, 25 lines of castling, 35 lines of other chess moves, and 62 lines remaining representing the algorithm. It would be nice to have a graphic user interface. I have already a glyph editor that would be great for designing chess pieces and a spreadsheet program that lays out glyphs in grids on the screen. Or we could implement the XBoard protocol and use XBoard for the user interface. I didn't implement all the rules of chess, in particular the possibility to claim a draw after 50 consecutive reversible moves, or a third occurrence of some position. It would be interesting to make a true chess engine that comes up with an answer in a short time using the available memory, even when the game cannot be ended quickly by force. The limitations of my program became clear when I fettered a position from a game between Kasparov and Kramnik in 1996. I saw this game in a video on Agat Matter's chess channel on YouTube. Go check it out, the link is in the description below. In this position, it's Kramnik's turn to move the black pieces. There's a mate in four moves. My program runs out of memory before a solution is found. Before I go on, if you want to solve this problem yourself without my spoiling it for you, please pause the video now. I'm going to show the solution on the screen in a couple seconds. If we spell out the solution by applying the first move, we still run out of memory. White has several responses. The solver can find the mate in three quickly after most of them, but after one of White's responses, we still run out of memory. We have to add one more move by black to get an answer. So here the solver can't even handle mate in three. There are many pieces on the board and many possible moves. The game tree is too broad. It will take more programming ideas to deal with middle games. But that's all for now. Thanks for coming by.